Hello, everybody. Welcome to ASUS ProArt Webinar. And my name is Amber. I'm the Territory Product Manager for ProArt in the EMEA region. And I am also the host for today. It's really great to see so many of you from all walks of life joining us live today. So no matter you are ASUS business partner or colorist, photographer, graphic designer, really a big warm welcome to see all of you. And together with me today, uh, we have Nikki and Blake. Uh, Nikki, she is the ASUS product director for ProArt Monitors. And then we also have Blake. He is the world-renowned colorist for more than 30 years of experience. So ladies first, uh, Nikki, how are you? I'm doing good, how are you? Would you like to say something to everyone? Yeah, hello everyone. It's really great to meet you here. I'm Nikki in charge of product management in ASUS for ProR display. Nice to meet you. Great, and how about Blake? Uh, I'm a colorist with over 30 years of experience and also with product development and engineering. So nice to have you with us today. Great, so let's have a quick look of what will be on the agenda today. Uh, first, we will have uh, Nikki, who will be walking us through about the display text and products, and followed by Blake, who will be telling us more details about what you need in terms of hardware to build a proper HDR grading suite. And then for content creators who is online with us today, uh, we have a bonus from Blake. He will be sharing with us some tricks and tips on Resolve tools and DVO tools. So that will be something that all of us could learn from. But before we start, I think it will be good that I start with some uh, product introduction. So Porat is created nine years ago with the sole purpose to deliver the best professional monitor for content creators. So no matter you are photogra uh, photographers or videographer or animator, architects, engineers, uh, we always want to have the best professional monitor with the best color accuracy for you. And until today, we continue to do so by pushing the boundary to create innovative features as well as to create new industry standard like uh, VESA, Display HDR 1400 needs. That is something that we achieve as the highest so far in terms of the certification from VESA. And as well as we are the first PC monitor maker that comes with Dolby Vision Certified on our high-end PA32 monitors. So with all this commitment, we always want to drive and deliver the best professional monitor to you. And many times I hear people or I see people uh, asking in the forum or their private company, uh, community group and asking for recommendation, what are the good HDR monitor that I should get for my workflow and stuff like that. So I think it would be something interesting from ASUS as a manufacturer that we have a summary for you that tell you what are the key elements that we look for as a manufacturer to deliver the best professional monitor. And that will become a buying guide for you when you look out for a HDR monitor to buy. So then we will have Nikki, who is our pro art product director, to walk us through some key elements that she really focus and strive for the best when she makes the professional monitor. So Nikki. Okay. Uh, when talking about the professional display, uh, what elements we should focus? There are three S's. The first is display panel, and second is hardware engine. The third is firmware driving. What function related about the panel itself? Of course, the color. Right now, the white color gamma is getting larger and larger. So above 90% DCI-P3 will be requirement, and it's quite fundamental. And of course, the true 10-bit color depth. 
And because HDR generation is coming, so the contrast ratio we require to achieve a median level. And for the brightness uh, as well, the HDR, so above 1000 nits is our recommendation. For the resolution, it's up to your uh, target user or your content editing workflow. So up to uh, 4HD, that one is good enough for the PC or website design. And of course, for the 4K, 6K, or 8K, it's recommend for the video production. For the hardware engine, this one, the color engine is always very key in the display. The big size 1D, 3D lookup table for color accuracy and for the two 10 bit data processing, these two can drive very accurate color. And for the format, uh, right now, the multiple HDR display is also the requirement. Connectivity, this one is related about your productivity. To enlarge your productivity, you have to support multiple uh, input resource, uh, the HDMI display port, or even the SDI will be better. And if this display can support PIP, PVP, or even daisy chain, that will be good for your uh, productivity. For the firmware driving, when you're having the uh, good hardware, of course, you need to have very exactly uh, precisely uh, firmware driving. For the baseline driving, of course, to achieve median level must be K zone, more than 1,000 zone dimming control. And when you have this dimming control, of course, you need to have very precise data analysis and the compensation. And preset mode, this one is not just only uh, talk about the factory side when the manufacturer to ship uh, the monitor. The calibration also need to guarantee after you use. So the rewritable lookup table will be requirement. And for the firmware upgrade, because we always upgrading our feature. So this ability is also quite important. After above uh, elements we focus, right now we are going to talking about more detail in some feature. The first is ultra high contrast ratio. Here you can see there are two families. The first one is LCD and the second is OLED. In these two families, uh, if you are you have the direct type uh, local dimming for array uh, by light, this one can generate more than a median level conscious ratio. And here are two structures. The first one is single cell. It means uh, the all the bright level, all the gray level is controlled by the LED directly. And there another there is another structure we call the steel cell. It's been the uh, the dimming is controlled by the second panel. And for the OLED family, they are uh, actually have two categories. The first one we call this white OLED. It's been always have white pixel layer. Right now the TV OLED is belong to this kind of structure. And because white pixel, so sometimes the color will be a little bit concerned. And for the pure RGB OLED, there are two categories as well. The first one is quantum dark. That one use the blue lighting uh, organic LED OLED uh, uh, there. So this one can generate very pure RGB lighting, but because the pixel array is not pure stripe, so the color still have a little bit concern. And for the printing RGB OLED, this one is real pure RGB lighting and pure RGB strap. So the color could be very accurate. Uh, in this uh, different structure, you can see the first one uh, is really good for driving very high brightness. Uh, it can achieve even above 4,000 nits. And others can generate very uh, true bright but the brightness will be limited. Right now it's around uh, 2000 or even the 500 in OLED. And when uh, you are driving the very high brightness in the single layer, uh, the red type LED, this one may not uh, so efficient in the big view angle uh, because the halo, but uh, in ASUS, 
we got very good solution to reduce the halo we call the uh, of assets contrast optimization. This one uh, we already attach in our new product PS32 UCX HP. This one can reduce 80% halo effect and to gain even the seven times contrast when you are looking the display in quite view a uh, big view angle. So right now the uh, halo will be not a big concern in this display. Okay, and this one we are talking about the white color gamma. We know in this industry it's not possible to achieve 100% rec 2020 color specs, but the 95% is achievable. Uh, but 95% uh, is come from the RGB laser lighting. This kind of lighting source is not good for human eye to watch the rating. So right now this one only we can see the solution in the projector product product pro, product. And for the others good for the monitor solution, we have quantum dot. Uh, this one is used the blue LED to generate blue lighting, distribute the quantum dot and generate very pure RGB peak spectrum. And KSF, this one is mean a uh, special phosphor LED, also uh, can generate very good color. Both of them can achieve around 80 to 82% co coverage in the REC 2020. And for the quantum dot OLED and printing OLED, both of them can achieve 90%, so it's quite good. And in Pro R display, we have three different kinds of display to offer you a good white color gamma. And when we're talking about the HDR format, there are many different formats in this field. The fundamental HDR10 and uh, the one with the dynamic data, metadata, the Dolby Vision one. And HLG uh, is common be used in the broadcasting and HDR10 plus also with dynamic metadata, but the content is very few. Also Technicolor HDR uh, is not much as well. And in Pro R, we also offer you the multiple formats. So the HDR10, the Dolby Vision, the HLG, they are support in Pro R display. And the HDR because when you are doing the editing, you are not uh, final yet. You you need to review the HDR performance timely without the frag, without any packing with the metadata. And in Pro R, we can have this uh, preview more. So it's very efficient when you are doing the editing. Okay, then it's color calibration. This one, uh, we have our own technology. We call this Asus Pro R calibration. Uh, this one is a hardware solution. You can rewrite back your calibrate data into our monitor IC directly. So it can secure your color accuracy uh, even after uh, several years. And because we have our own technology, so of course we can uh, co-work with the very famous Light Illusion and famous Kalman, these two solutions in the field. So all of them in Pro R display we support. And of course, the HDR calibration is available as well. Here I would like to uh, introduce our uh, Pro R display calibration UI to let you have an overview. Here you can see the SDR and HDR format is selectable. And also the color gamma, you can select this IP3, like 2020, and brightness and color temperature, and also PQ or HLG EOTF curve is also selectable. So it's quite a very complete solution for you. Okay, okay, and after introduce above features, 
Oh, here we just let you know the PR32 UCX HP and PR27 UCX. Both of them already available in the market. They carry with all our advanced technology, including the quantum dot, including the of assets contrast optimization to reduce halo and the peak brightness can achieve more than 1000 and the white color gamma achieve 99% DZP3. Also the common ready and light illusion are support. And we got this at this HDR 1035 and Dolby Vision certified. Not just only flagship model we working for, also we have very mainstream uh, model one we call uh, PA27AQ and PA24Q, 24AQ. Uh, both of them is very good solution for your 2D, 3D, or your photographic design because the color is still very accurate. Uh, they, they, they are certified from uh, Kelman. So you don't worry about the color, even in this kind of mainstream. And others, you can see the HDR support display. We have PA27, we have PA24, we have 32 inch, and even the 34 inch with the curve. And the fancy one is our portable OLED, the PQ22UC. The one used the printing OLED. So the color is quite uh, very accurate and it's good for your mobility. And our friendship, PS32 UCX, PS27 UCX. Finally, I'm very, very glad to announce our new model, PS32 UCG. Uh, this one uh, is world first. It, 1,600 nits available with 120 hertz variable refresh rate. Why variable refresh rate? Because this one can generate very smooth performance when you are rendering your motion uh, editing. And also this one is, uh, is the uh, only one get display HDR uh, 1400 category certified. And of course, the Dolby Vision and Kelman Ray Light Illusion also support. This one is coming soon in this year, December. So let's see. Okay. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you for your clear introduction of the entire ProArt monitor technology as well as the lineup. I think I want to emphasize this part like we do have from you know, like the commitment that we have for no matter you are a graphic designer, that you need good color accuracy all the way to you are colorist, that you need HDR and, you know, even higher Dolby Vision certification. We have really a complete lineup for all of you. So especially uh, many customers are asking for HDR format delivery. So I think having one of these uh, pro art monitor in your workflow is definitely worth the investment. So, but pro art is not just about professional monitors. Uh, we do have uh, more product lines in this family. So as you can see, we have a studio book and also PA90 mini PC, uh, which has uh, ISV certification that ensures you that you have good quality when you do your content creation with this popular software. And of course, we are also happy that we have a new member to this ProArt family, and that is uh, ASUS ProArt Z490 motherboard that we just launched a month ago. And today, I'm also very pleased to have uh, Miguel. Uh, he is uh, ASUS Switzerland's country product manager for motherboards, and he will be here to share with us more highlights about what we have on this uh, ProArt Z490 motherboard that will be great for content creators. So let's welcome Miguel. Hello, Hello. Amber. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here. No problem. I'm uh, honored to present the newest member from the mainboard team for the uh, ProArt lineup. and. Uh, as you mentioned, it's based on the Z490, yeah. so uh, Intel 10th generation for all the performance needed. Uh, it's a clean, aesthetic, basically functional, so uh, 
no RGBs for bling bling to distract from work of the artist. It's meant to be a tool, a tool for you to build the system you actually want and need if you don't have another version of it like in a PA90, if you need some uh, more special, uh, if you have more special wishes or need certain tools. So I will go through it quickly. So I said 10th generation, uh, 10th generation Intel CPU. We have four DIMM slots for up to 128 gigabyte of RAM. We have for the internal storage needs, fast storage, we have two M.2s. One is here underneath and one is here. Then uh, additionally, two times 16 uh, for graphic cards. So uh, it's up to you to decide if you want to use a consumer graphic card or a professional graphic card like a Quadro series. Uh, the first truly special part here that is meant for uh, for uh, content creators is actually and now I will turn this around here we have two times Thunderbolt 3 connectors and to bring the video signal to the Thunderbolt 3 we have an additional cable that comes with it and with that, you can route the picture information, uh, the display out of your graphic cards into the main board and then out through the Thunderbolt. So if you have Thunderbolt enabled daisy chains display wise, you can uh, use the display out actually through the Thunderbolt. Also by being two, uh, you can also have fast connection to your Thunderbolt storage. Then. As additional, this is a well here. This is a 2.5 gigabit network connector uh, with the uh, Intel uh, chip, and that is not enough. If this is the second or another highlight of this mainboard, we give with it this 10 gigabit card. So basically, you have two connections: one times 10 gigabit and one times 2.5 gigabit. So you couldn't actually be connected to a network, storage mm -hmm. network, and at the same time to maybe your company network. Yeah. So uh, for uh, editing group projects, maybe in 4K or so, it should, you will have all the bandwidth being internal storage or external storage that you need. Yeah. So I think with this base to build the tool uh, of a PC that you need for your content creation or your artistic endeavors. Yeah. I think it's a great addition to all the products that you showed before. Yeah. And uh, well, totally agree. Because now I know that many people like Netflix is booming with many interesting drama series. So many people are like working together as a group to make a big drama or big movies. So definitely having these will assist them in the collaborative work together. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you very much for having Thank me. Thank you. So we have now a very clear introduction of all these hardware and professional products from the Pora family. So let's move on to a big, bigger picture. Having this, how do you have these hardware integrated into your grading suite? How would this hardware be good when you want to build a proper studio. So I think for this topic, there is no other better person to talk about this rather than besides Blake. So Blake, Hi. I know you are a colorist. Yes. And mm -hmm. also, of course, you are also a product developer, a technical advisor for studios who want to set up their uh, installation or system in the studios, right? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So I believe you have a very rich experience of like you see how things evolve, your industry evolve, system evolve, or even how the display technology has evolved. So maybe uh, you could share with us more how would you see from the past versus present and how the trend evolve? And I think the most important thing for people online today is to know what they need to really handle their work today, especially oh, in HDR. Okay. So, 
Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, so um, basically in my experience, I've seen the industry evolve from being very film centric. We were doing everything off film and then now we've migrated to basically everything, almost everything digital. And so with this also, comes the situation with HDR. Um, many of the um, companies such as Netflix and even um, the major studios like Disney, everything like this, are all providing HDR deliverables. And Netflix requires HDR um, deliverables as well to be uh, given to them. And then even the um, broadcasters from the individual countries are all requiring HDR material as well. And so with that in mind, let's have a look at what you really do need when you're going to put together an HDR grading suite. So let me come over here and let's uh, share my... Okay, so what we're going to have to do first is we want to assemble our HDR grading suite. And what you need is a video I.O. device to get out of the computer and into your monitor. And so with that in mind, you, you need something, for example, a Blackmagic Decklink 4K Extreme if you're working with a PC, either Windows or Linux. And um, this is an ideal card for this. It even supports Dolby Vision as well. And then if you're working in a Thunderbolt environment, uh, then you can use the Blackmagic Ultra Studio 4K Mini, or also there's the 4K Mini Extreme as well. And then, of course, the most important link in the chain is a monitor. You have to know what you're delivering. And so basically, you want to know that what you see is what you're going to get. And for that, I will always use, for example, a ProArt PA32 UCX, just like what I'm using here. Now we come over to our grading suite checklist. So for example, here, number one is an HDR grading monitor. Number two, okay, we need a good computer, a computer that's powerful enough to be able to work with the content that we're um, bringing in. We need a video IO device like we mentioned earlier, and we need media storage that is fast enough. And so, for example, then we need to think about our room lighting and then also data backup solution because we want to make sure that our media is backed up properly. And then when we're thinking about room lighting, we need to make sure that room lighting is non-contaminating so thereby your perception of color is not being influenced by the light in the room. ASUS also has the ProArt PQ22UC. This is a small, compact 4K OLED display. This is perfect. I sometimes take this when I'm doing location grading. Comes with a little carry tote bag. I can put that in there, connect it to my monitor, uh, to the laptop, and I'm all set to go then. Okay, now with this point, in mind, let's come over to tips and tricks. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you a couple of little resolve tips and some tricks when I'm dealing with certain types of media. And then afterwards, we're going to look at the DVO tools from Filmworks and Digital Vision World. Okay, one second, let me just change my share here. And then come here. And we come to resolve. Okay, so what we come over here now, and we've got the um, edit page in resolve. And normally when I'm doing a chroma key in resolve, I'm actually working with the color page. You can use a qualifier to define the chroma key area, but you can also do this using fusion and fusion makes a superbly clean chroma key. So for example, if I want to work on this shot. We've got the shot here of the um, gentleman in the spaceship here, and I want to replace the green screen area. So what I do first is I come over and let's take the background and just drop that on top. And then I just wanna shorten that clip up a little bit. 
Okay, so now we have the two clips, and then I need to select them both, right mouse click on them, and then in the menu appears, I'll select new fusion clip. Now once that happens, as you can see, both clips disappear, and now it's just replaced with one clip that's labeled the fusion clip. And then as you can see those little sparkles there, that indicates that this clip has fusion processing in it. So we're all finished here. We can now proceed over to the Fusion page. And now, as you can see here, my Fusion node tree has already been pre-built for me because I created this Fusion clip. So we have Media 1 and Media 2. So as you can see, on the bottom of each node are two buttons. And those can be activated by using button 1 or button 2 on your computer keyboard. So as you can see, if I push button number one, viewer number one is now illuminated. And if I push button number two, I'll see the picture on number two. So, okay, let's work with viewer number one. And now I want to create a chroma key. So in order to put a tool in Fusion, what I, there's several ways you can bring up the menu. So if you do shift spacebar, this will bring up the tool selection area, and then all you have to do is type in maybe the first letter of the tool that you want to bring up, and then it will do a search for it and filter that. The other way to do it is if you right mouse click and select add tool, and then you've got all your tools that come up there. Or the other way to do it is you can come over to the top and click on effects library, and then we can come over here to Matt. And then in this case, I'm going to use the Ultra Keyer. So I'll just take the Ultra Keyer, drag it into the link. And as you can see, the color changes. So I've got two colors there, which is fine. And then I let go the left mouse button. And now it's actually been inserted into the chain. So now what I can do here is select the Ultra Keyer. And now I want to click on my background color. And once I do this, this will allow me to sample the color for the green screen. So if I click on the eyedropper, come in here, select that by clicking on with the left mouse button, and then I click OK. Now, as you can see, the green screen has been identified. Now, there's a little bit of fallout there, so I can then come over here to my controls and then just tweak that a little bit like so. Okay, so then if I come over to the merge tool, this will show me the two being brought together. So if I come over here and put that in viewer number one, as you can see here, it shows me just the planet, which means that my foreground and background are the wrong way around. So all I do is right mouse click on it and select swap inputs. And so then what happens here is I can see the planet now inside the green screen area. Now what I want to do next is I want to inject a color corrector here. So what I'm going to do is come back up to my menu, select color corrector by holding down the left mouse button and drag it into this part of the chain. And then now I can come over here and then color grade the planet in the window there. Now, if I want to make a color correction over the entire shot, then I can take another color corrector and drag it down here like so. And now this will be, as it's being done after the composite, now this will grade everything. So if I come over here, select that, and now I can change this, for example. So this will make an overall change to the entire shot. Okay, so there we have it. If we come over to the color page now, as you can see, I have my entire color correction has been done and rendered, and it shows me this is a fusion clip and it's got fusion processing. If you look here, as you can see, the number does not have any indication that a color grading has been applied because it's actually been done earlier. If I were to change something here in the resolve primaries, as you can see now, because I've made a primary color correction inside the color page of Resolve, then you have a little rainbow effect around the number indicating that that has been done. Okay, so now that we're in the color page, we want to look at something like the um, OpenFX plugins. So the OpenFX plugins are a great way of touching up your picture, 
taking out items that you don't want, um, stabilizing. You can, there's so many things that you can do there. So what I'm going to do here is let's um, come up to uh, a little bit earlier here. Come past sharp, no, refine. Okay, so I have these refine tools, which we have, we can shrink our alpha mat, shrink and grow, or we have a beauty filter or I wanna use face refinement. So in order to use face refinement, all I do is do command S to make a new node, take the face refinement tool, drop it in like there. And then the next thing I need to do is analyze the shot. So as you can see, the face refinement tool is geared that it actually looks at the contours of a human face. So as you can see, there's a grid that's being put over the face and as you can see here, there is a small little box around it. And that indicates that's the face that was found. If you had more than one face in the picture, you'll have about three or four different squares. And then you select the one that you actually want to work on. And it's quite an intelligent track because as you can see there, the guy actually walked in front of the picture and it didn't really care. So if I come back to here and then turn off the overlay, and then I can come here and now I've got eye retouching. And so I can come over here and brighten up her eyes, for example. And then I've got eye light. Okay. And then we can do eye bag removal. And then we can do some sharpening in there. And then we can come over and do forehead retouching, do smoothness here. Now, if I want to look at this full screen, okay, I've pretty much gone overboard on this, but gives you an extreme idea of how strong it is. And then if I come over here and bypass it, it shows you how much that I can actually do. And then it automatically takes this through the entire shot. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, put the correction back on. Okay. Now, if we come over to um, back into the library, we've got other things which you can do, which is object removal, patch replacement. Object removal is great if you have something that was in the set and you wanna remove it. You can easily put the, a window around it, analyze it, and then it will sample the surrounding information and remove the information inside the window. If there is moving texture inside though, then you need to use what we call patch replacement. Patch replacement will take a sampling of all the movement in the image and then replace the area that you created with the patch replace tool. Okay, so then what we have next is um, in this shot, okay, I'm gonna come over here first and just make a small primary correction here. Okay, and then do this. Okay, so we have on the bottom, when we scroll down, a series of tools, DVO tools from the um, Filmworks. And then we have things such as brick wall, chroma, clarity, pixel, regrain, and sharpen. So for example, here, if I want to take the, um, let's say sharpen, for example, let's take that drag that into here and then I can come over here and just adjust my controls accordingly. And then I can just do spatial strength if I want to. And then if I come back to here full and then I can come and do it before, of course that's showing me without the color correction as well. And then if I come back to here, you can then come over and take it out like so. Now there are other tools here that are um, things such as um, regrain. So for example, this works out extremely well if you've got um, maybe one shot that shot digitally and the rest of the material is all film based and you need to add a little bit of grain into the picture. So what you can do is you can come up to, let's say uh, this shot here, and you say, okay, I want to add some film grain there. So first let's put a little bit of correction there, something like that. And then let's just add a node 
add regrain to that, drop it in. And then we can select the amount too. So as you can see, if you can select this and you can see the amount that's being done on there. So I just make it a little bit overboard. So it's a bit too much there. And then maybe take the saturation out and just do a little bit like that because we don't want it to be too steady. And then we just take it in like here. Maybe we'll just take it a little less there. And then this way, what happens is that if you go to full screen and then you can see the grain that's been added on top of the picture then. Now, what you can do as well is you can pre-build these into power grades. Resolve has what we call power grade libraries, which allow you to build up effects that you're going to be using. So if you have different grain levels that are very useful, you can build them up into these tools. So as you can see here, I've got DVO regrain one, two. So I did this at different levels. So if I come up to, let's say, a shot like this here, and I say, oh, okay, I want to use regrain one. And then what you do is right mouse click on here and select display the node graph, bring it down, come up here and drag it into the picture. So as you can see here now, if I just come over and deselect that one, you can see with the grain or without, and you see if you come to the grain area here and bring that up, you can see that's with the grain tool applied. And then if I turn it off, that's without the grain tool applied. And it's important to note that, I mean, they have a wide range of tools that are available, even a brick wall filter that can be added in here. And uh, so you can see there's the brick wall, chroma, clarity, pixel, sharpen, and it all works very seamlessly within Resolve. And it just becomes another of your member of your F OpenFX library. So it's a very easy tool to use. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna send it back to Amber and then we can come over and uh, continue from there. Thank you, Blake. Thank you so much because I think you just bring us into a very colorful and magical world that you know, we, we just change how we look things. It's really amazing. I think I should start practicing the color grading <laughs> stuff on my PA monitor here. Yeah. Really, thank you. Yeah, I, I know you just finished a recent artwork, uh, your, your project about the lava line, and I think you also use the PA32 and also use this uh, tricks to really finish Exactly, this was a project that was done. They, um, they went to the island of Vanuatu, yeah. uh, which is near uh, New Zealand, and they did a slack line walk across an active volcano. And oh. it was the first thing time it was done for the Guinness Book of World Records, it was actually entered in for that. And it was all shot with Black Magic Raw, and then it okay. came in and then I did the color grading for that. Mm -hmm. Right. So you did, you finished all the project with the PA32 in your studio. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think really PA32 is really something that you really own and then uh, use it. And it's great for like HDR color grading and HDR content. Exactly. Right? So many times I really, I hear you yourself, key opinion like leaders like you and Kevin Shaw from the ICA really recommending the PA32 mm -hmm. to colorists because of its good specs, good feature and affordability. Like for example, we are looking at like top notch 30K Sony monitor, but of course those are like the master of the grading monitor, but many of us simply can't afford that one in our own studio or own home. So really having like a PA32, like what you have in your studio, it's really something that you can start practicing and make yourself step ahead of the others in the HDR content creation. Yeah. This really, thank you for that. So uh, let's check if anyone has some question for Blake. So Blake, I think there's a question for you. Yes. Okay. How do you connect the monitor to the Black Magic card? Okay, that's pretty simple. Actually, uh, it's just a HDMI connection. Yeah. So that's simply the via the HDMI connection. Yeah. Right? It's simply. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think, do we have the next question? All right, I think there's one like a uh, 27 inch and 32 inch, which size would you recommend 
for yeah. color grading? I, if, you, if you have enough real estate in the grading suite, in other words, a yeah. big enough room, I recommend a 32 inch. Um, in my grade, so for your instance, you, your room, I think yeah. is large enough. Yeah, mine is large enough. I have two 32 inch uh, units and basically I use one for the graphic user interface and then I have one for the grading monitor. Uh, the reason I do that too is because, um, I want the color on the graphic user interface to be as close to the grading monitor as possible. And this by, I have an exact match. Yeah. Right. So like, I think it's really like what Blake said, it's depending on your real estate. So if your desk is really white and big, you can have like 232. And if not, you can have 132 or 127. And actually Asus Pro Art has the solution for you, no matter 27 or 32. So yeah, you could exactly. either just choose depending on your space. Right. Precisely. Yeah. And do we have more questions for Blake? Let's see. I only have a quarter of a card. Is it possible to use a display port to color? Um, you can use the display port to color. Yeah, it's no problem for color grading. Uh, I've used it. It was no problem. It works fine. Yeah. Okay. And a matter of fact, I actually have at home on my grading suite at home. I have a couple of quadro cards and that's fine. Yeah. Right. And you, and you also, also have, have a PA90, right? right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, the PA90 is a great computer because it's very powerful. It's got a fantastic graphics card inside. And even the one with the, um, the Quadro 2000, I found performed extremely well. And we used it with a Blackmagic film scanner and performance was fantastic. And mm -hmm. it, if you know the Blackmagic film scanner, it's actually being controlled by Resolve as well. And so for that, the uh, PA90 was fast enough. It kept on with it, didn't overheat. Yeah. There was no problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we have a question about Nuke. Do you uh, also, you also use Nuke, Nuke comp uh, composition? Uh, like card. Um, I don't particularly uh, personally use Nuke uh, compositing. I'm doing everything using Fusion and Resolve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any but more I questions we have it, there? It Maybe we be. will take the last question. Mm -hmm. But I imagine it could be used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Is there a big difference between an 8 bit and a 10 bit monitor? Yes, there is. Yeah, definitely you want to go with a 10 bit. Yeah. Um, because when you get it with 8 bit displays, then you're going to get staircasing and things like that on it. Yeah. So that's why uh, we, we always make a 10 bit on our high end PA. So you are rest assured of that. That's why quality. I always tell people when you are connecting to a grading monitor, don't use the computer out, but actually have a video IO device to connect to the monitor. Because the, um, some grading software, when you take the, uh, just the computer output from the software and you use that to drive a grading monitor, it's only sending an 8-bit display out, yeah. And so the 8-bit signal is gonna get staircasing in it, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so look out for 10 bit, true yeah, 10 exactly. bit. 10 bit yeah. all the way through, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that's good. And I think with that, we have come to the end of the webinar today. Really thank you for joining us and staying all the way with us till now. And I believe if you have further product questions, please just feel free to drop me, Amberlyn, uh, email. You can see the email address here. And if you have more questions about, about uh, color grading or setting up your suite for Blake, feel free to also drop Blake an uh, email and or subscribe to his YouTube channel that you can learn more skills from him and become a master of color grading. And before we end, just a gentle reminder that there will be a survey popped out when we finish the webinar. And please don't be too quick to close them. Please help us to fill it up and let us know what you think so we can always improve our next content and webinar. So till next time, this is Amber. Take care and bye-bye.